Load the two outer magnets into the bottom flat work using an arbor press. I use a one-ton arbor press with a small neodymium magnet on the rim to keep everything straight. Secure the bobbin assembly jig around the outside magnets with a rubber band. I use an assembly jig of my own design with each one carefully thickness to the exact coil height I need for each model. Once the jig is in place, insert the rest of the magnets into the holes, then press them in one at a time on the arbor press. Now to prepare the top flat work piece. I ream out the top flat work with a reamer of identical size. For 187 thousandths, or 3 16 pole piece flat work, I use a 187 thousandths reamer. The tiny amount of fiberboard the reamer removes actually goes a long way in preventing the top flat work from flaring up around the magnets, which not only doesn't look good, but can also prevent the pickup cover from seating properly. It also allows a little more surface area for the superglue to wick in, which I'll be using to secure the magnets in the flat work. With the top flat work reamed out, place it over the magnets and hammer it down. Only hammer it down part of the way, then use a call on top. The holes on the call I made are oversized, so they slip comfortably over the pole pieces. The call covers the entire top flat work piece and ensures that it presses down flush against the assembly jig. You can also press the top flat work piece with the arbor press. However, when using this method, I still lightly hammer the flat work onto the pole pieces to get it started and to make sure it stays centered while being pressed down. Using the arbor press is particularly helpful when pressing the top flat work piece very far down, like on a noiseless stacked pickup, where the middle flat work piece acts as a divider between the top and bottom coils, or when making Bill Lawrence micro coil style single coils, where the middle flat work piece merely acts as a spacer, so you can have a very short coil with the same mounting height as a normal, taller coil. Whichever method you use, once the top flat work is fully seated, it's time to move on to the next step. Remove the rubber band and the assembly jig, being careful not to lift the top flat work up at all by pulling up on the assembly jig. Pull sideways to take them out without disturbing the top flat work position. Apply thin super glue around each of the pole pieces. The glue will quickly wick in around the base of the magnets and any excess can be removed with a Q-tip. Work quickly to make sure that none of the cotton on the Q-tip gets stuck to the top flat work piece. Flip the pickup over and repeat the process on the underside of the top flat work. As the underside is not going to be visible, aesthetics don't matter and I can focus on saturating the area with glue. Move it around with a toothpick to make sure every single pole piece has plenty of glue to wick into any voids, then clean it with a Q-tip. Repeat the process on the bottom flat work. For the bottom, I only glue one side. Keep in mind that the top flat work was reamed and the bottom was not. The bottom flat work piece is also considerably thicker than the top, holds the magnets more securely, and doesn't need as much reinforcing. The top flat work is the most at risk for warping under the tension of the coil. Use an X-Acto knife to clean up fiberboard residue on the bottom flat work piece. You can use the blade like a pick and simply pluck the fiberboard remnants out. This gives the pickup a much cleaner, more professional look. Now to get rid of any burrs, snags, or roughness that the fine magnet wire could potentially get hung up on. A small smooth cut file of just about any make and model will work fine here. Go around all the edges of the top and bottom flat work where the magnet wire will be touching. Make sure there are no bumps or any points where the wire could snag, including the top of the eyelets, which sometimes can protrude enough to catch the wire while winding. Take those down along with all the other surfaces until they're nice and smooth. Next up is polyimide tape. Galvanic corrosion will occur between the copper and the wire and the aluminum in the rod magnets unless there's an insulator between them. This protects the coil windings from damage as corrosion or rust on the pole pieces can eat through the delicate magnet wire and kill the pickup. Captain Tape is a popular brand. I use 13mm tape for my half inch tall bobbins with 719 thousandths tall pole pieces and 15mm tape for my 570 thousandths tall bobbins with 780 thousandths tall pole pieces. If you can't find a commercially available tape with the appropriate width for your bobbin, lay a strip of the tape you do have down on a cutting mat. A length of about 5.5 inches will be enough to completely cover the pole pieces on a typical Stratocaster style bobbin. Then measure the inside of the bobbin with digital calipers and lock them. Lay a ruler down along the tape and use the caliper jaws to match the distance between the edge of the ruler and the edge of the tape on either end. Those distances should match as perfectly as possible with one jaw right against the edge of the ruler and the other against the edge of the tape. The tape can stretch a little bit, 
so it's better to leave the tape a little wider instead of narrower to guarantee full coverage of the magnets. Once you've got the ruler in position, hold it down firmly and use a sharp X-Acto knife to cut along the ruler. You'll then have a strip of tape that will fit snugly and completely around the pull pieces. On especially short bobbins, using a pair of needle nose pliers to wrap the tape will be necessary. I use my fingers to lay the entire strip of tape along one side of the pull pieces, then use the needle nose pliers to grab the overhanging tape and pull it taut around the magnets. I'll repeat this on the other side and then cut off any excess. Once the bobbin is taped and ready to wind, I tap the appropriate threads into the bottom flat work piece. This ensures the pickup mounting machine screws will thread in easily and have a straight and secure grip. For fender style pickups, I use a 632 tap as well as a drill guide of my own design. It's made of quarter inch MDF and has countersunk holes for the eyelets so the pickup can sit flush against the surface. I chuck the tap into a cordless hand drill, then run it clockwise through the guide until just a little of the tap is sticking out above the top. Then I'll lay the pickup bobbin down into position and hold it firmly while drilling clockwise all the way through the drill guide and the flat work. I'll then reverse the drilling direction and back it out. I repeat the process on the other side after flipping the bobbin over and repositioning it on the drill guide. Once both sides are completed, the screws will thread in easily, ensuring a smooth and frustration-free installation. However, there's one more step before moving forward. Using a file to smooth over the flat work again. The flat work can flare out when tapping the screw holes, and the magnet wire can and will snag on those flares. File over both screw holes and make sure those flares are thoroughly eliminated and the flat work completely smooth. Of course, you can also tap the bottom flat work by itself before the bobbin is assembled or before taping around the magnets. And then there's only one more thing to consider before continuing. Mistakes. If you make a mistake, such as installing the wrong type or length of rod magnet, don't panic. You can load the assembly jig back onto the bobbin and place the pickup onto a pull piece block. A thick block with oversized pull piece holes drilled all the way through it. With Stratocaster pickups, where the pull pieces protrude above the top flat work piece, placing the pickup face down will immediately line it up perfectly over the block. Then use a pin punch and a hammer to knock the pull piece out. The assembly jig will ensure the flat work doesn't move, extracting only the pull piece and leaving everything else perfectly in its original position. The new pull piece can then be pressed in with the arbor press right through both flat work pieces. It'll be fairly loose, so it's critical to superglue the rod magnet on both ends, just like the first time. In a perfect world, you'll never have to do this, but it's important to have a quick, actionable plan in place for when things go wrong. And now we can finally move on to the part you've all been waiting for. The coil winding. I keep my 5 pound spools in customized plastic containers. I screwed a dowel into the bottom, which acts as a holder for the spool, installed a wooden bead on the lid that acts as an exit hole for the magnet wire as it derails off the spool, loaded the spool with a whisker disc, which keeps the wire from getting stuck on the spool as it derails, and also adds quite a bit of tension to the wire, and glued a magnet to the lid that acts as a holder for my wire tensioning device, which is a Stumac kerfing clamp and two pieces of single-ply pickguard material lined with loop Velcro. Popsicle sticks with felt double stick taped around them also work very well. These plastic pitchers are an alternative spool container that work perfectly and should be much more readily available. I simply mount a bead in the lid and don't even use a dowel through the bottom, and the sizable handle actually makes these even more portable and user-friendly than the canister style containers. The tensioner stays on the lid for the duration of the spool, which keeps the tension consistent from pickup to pickup until the spool is gone and it ensures I only have to get the tension dialed in one time when the spool is new. The container protects the delicate wire and also prevents it from whipping around and catching on anything at very high RPMs, such as 4300 RPMs, which is the top speed of the pen pal lathe. I put the spool of wire on the floor, then attach the tensioner to a magnet I have glued to the drawer on the nightstand I use as my workstation. The magnet holds the tensioner in place and allows me to pull a length of magnet wire and hold it taut, which greatly helps in tinning the wire. Tinning the wire is extremely important as it not only guarantees the most solid and permanent electrical connection possible, but it also forms this electrical connection without loading the eyelet with solder. This will allow for testing the pickup mid-wind while it's still attached to the winding machine, which is especially useful in the case of a wire break or making a tapped coil to verify that the splice or tap was successful before continuing. 
After carefully running a tin soldering iron along the magnet wire, it's time to tie it around the eyelet. I had to do this in a camera-friendly way, so normally I hold the pickup a bit differently, but the idea is you thread the wire through one end, pull it out the other, then loop it around and back through the hole at least three times. I usually do it five or six times for good measure. Then I'll wrap the wire around the bobbin several times by hand to secure the start wire in place and get the bobbin ready to mount. Then I place the bobbin onto the bobbin plate, which I built with a 440 machine screw in the center, and a couple depressions for the eyelets so the pickup can sit flush on the plate. I put a small washer over the screw that covers two of the pole pieces, then fasten a nut over it using a small socket by hand. This locks the pickup down so it can't move while winding. Next up is the traverse limiter. I made mine out of two drill stops and the tail stock and tool rest of the pen pal lathe. To set the limiter, we need to know the height between the top and bottom flat work of the pickup bobbin. I already know the height for this pickup, but to demonstrate, you find it with digital calipers like this. I subtract approximately 20 thousandths of an inch from the measurement to account for the wire going out of bounds when aggressively scatter winding or simply winding at high RPMs. The wire can throw a bit, so if you don't narrow the traverse limiter space by a small amount, the wire can end up wrapping around the flat work or even the pole pieces on top of the pickup, which is a real headache to fix. I leave the leftmost drill stop fixed in place, so I only have to move one drill stop. Place the locked caliper jaws against the leftmost drill stop, then hold the other drill stop firmly against the outside of the jaws and tighten the Allen screw. The pen pal tool rest can slide left and right, which is a major convenience. You can really fine-tune your spacing this way. Wind at a slow speed, watching the wire and making sure it travels fully to each end of the pickup. When you've got full coverage, lock the tool rest in place and you're ready to wind. Pickup winding footage never gets old to me. I probably shouldn't stick around here for several minutes, just showing the coil building up and the pickup spinning around at high speeds, but there is something hypnotic about it. Think about something that's bothering you. Really focus on it. Then just watch as it goes around, and around, and around, and you forget all about it. And we're done. And that problem you had isn't bothering you anymore. Isn't that crazy? But speaking of problems, let's address an important mistake before continuing. Wire breakage during the winding of the pickup. What do you do? The first step is to unwind the broken wire. Get enough so you can pull it down over the work surface. Then pull it taut and use a piece of tape to hold it in place. Carefully apply some flux to the wire, then turn on your soldering iron. Clean the tip thoroughly, then lightly tin it with fresh solder. Get some new wire off the spool, then line up the new wire parallel with the broken wire, right on top of it in a straight line. There's a bit of a feel to this, and it can be a little tricky. But once the iron catches both pieces of wire, if you run it up and down just right, it'll bond them together seamlessly. Here's some b-roll footage showing the process a little bit closer up. As you can see, it can take a little finagling to get the splice to work. It's critical to verify the integrity of the splice with a multimeter. This is a major benefit of tinning the wire before wrapping it around the eyelets, which I've mentioned previously. One probe on the splice and one probe on the start eyelet should get a stable DC resistance reading in the expected range. Once you've verified the integrity of the splice, make note of where the broken wire was the one taped down to the bench. Take a pair of mini flush cutters and cut off the remainder of the broken wire. Don't worry about the small amount of overhang that's left over. Very carefully pull off some extra wire from the spool and slowly turn the wire onto the pickup by hand until the splice is completely on the bobbin. Then put on an additional several turns of wire. The repair is complete and you're ready to go back to winding. With the winding completed, the nut can be loosened and removed, the pickup pulled off of the mounting screw, and the washer put back on the workbench. Then it's time to tin the finish lead the same way we did with the start lead. Tin the wire, starting just a little behind where the eyelet is, making sure to cover enough length of wire to get at least 3-6 to six loops around the eyelet. Break the wire a little before the area where the tinning stops, then thread it through the eyelet just like the first time. Now flip the pickup over and load each eyelet with solder. Simply hold the iron against the edge of the eyelet and feed some solder right into the iron and then around the perimeter of the eyelet. You'll get a feel for how much solder to use to get a nice professional look with rounded balls of solder. Then take your hookup wire and solder it to the eyelets. Heat the joint from the back, then feed the stripped or pushed back wire in from the front. Hold it in place while the solder cools. Repeat the process for the other hookup wire. 
To really make things look clean and to keep these connections solid for a lifetime, add a little flux to the eyelet joint as well as the tied magnet wire exposed on the edge of the flat work. Then tin your iron again and run it over the magnet wire and the eyelet to watch the magic happen. The flux will reflow the joint beautifully and get out any unsightly bumps, and now your magnet wire wrapped around the flat work edge, which is very prone to breaking, is heavily reinforced and ready for worry-free handling and installation. With the soldering completed, feed the hookup wires through the hole in the bottom flat work, pull them taut, and twist them together. Now the pickup is ready to label and sign. I use a number 8 sized Sakura Jelly Roll pen for black flat work pickups, and an ultra fine tip black sharpie for gray flat work and metal base plates. Then it's into the wax bath. I use a hold heat glue pot. Some people like potting their pickups less or more. I usually wait until the bubbles stop coming up, or about 5 to 10 minutes. When it's done, I turn the pickup sideways to let the bulk of excess wax drain back into the pot, then place it on a piece of paper towel and use another piece of paper towel to wipe it down. Make sure to move quickly and get all of the liquid wax off to make sure the finished pickup looks as clean and professional as possible. Magnetizing is next. I like to wait after potting so the coil is sealed and protected, as it requires you to get a fairly good grip on the coil. I use a Mojotone magnetizer, which is simply a small vise with neodymium bar magnets fixed to the jaws. I load the pickup in, then close the jaws all the way, then release them a little bit so I can move the pickup side to side a few times before removing it. I verify the magnetic polarity and gauss strength with a WT-10A gauss meter afterwards. And there you have it. My process for assembling and winding a single coil pickup, which I've changed and modified multiple times over the last five years. I may change some things in the future, but a lot of time, effort, practice, and refinement has gotten my pickup building process to the point it's at today. Be sure to check the link in the description box for my complete guide on testing pickups, which goes way beyond DC resistance into a realm you never even knew existed. There's so much more to pickups that I didn't cover in this video, so hit that like button and get ready for more guitar content you're not going to find anywhere else. Right here on GuitarMD.